So you were 12, if I remember reading correctly, 12, 13, when you said you decided that this was going to be it. Did Mr. Rushenoff tell you you should be a professional musician? Did it just, was it a road you just followed? And when did, how did you decide to go no, music? No, uh, Rushenoff actually, uh, he could really analyze each student on an individual basis. So he knew uh, what the strengths and weaknesses were, and he knew how to, uh, how to get the most out of, out of a student. And uh, he, would, uh, he would tell you a lot of things, and, and uh, you know, and you, and he had studies and exercises you did, and after you did them all, he said, now, forget about it, <laughs> and just play. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he really uh, was a, a great influence uh, as a person, uh, and and uh, it, it was, I would say, uh, a great learning experience without knowing it. Mm -hmm. You went to Curtis, and that must have also been an enormous leap to go well, to this incredible yes, musical Well, institute. what happened was, you know, uh, I, when I went to high school, I, I got into the High School of Music and Art, uh, which was in Manhattan, uh, up at 135th Street and Convent Avenue, uh, and it was, a cr it was uh, across the street from the High School of Music and Art in that neighborhood. And uh, this school was a really a great school because they had an orchestra. They had, well, they had uh, six orchestras and two bands and so forth. And so you played rehearsals every day in addition to a heavy academic schedule. And uh, uh, I would say ready to, uh, to uh, stay, you know, a long time there until I could absorb everything. And I, I wanted to, to move on to, uh, to a conservatory situation. Uh, but I couldn't get into Juilliard because you had to have a high school diploma. And I was, I was only, uh, at the time, I guess I was 15 or going on 15. So, but Curtis Institute in Philadelphia was an all-scholarship school. Uh, one uh, one uh, could enter that school at any age. Uh, they had eight-year-old uh, violin geniuses and, you know, and so forth, and only 100 students. So it really was like a very nurturing uh, situation uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, real family atmosphere. And uh, uh, so I, I, I took the audition, and I was very lucky to win it. And uh, I became the most famous dropout of the high school of music and art <laughs> after that. <laughs> now, I was going to spend, you know, you could stay forever at a place like Curtis, and some people did, some of my cronies like uh, Seymour Lipkin or, or Aaron Roseanne, they never actually left the building. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I would have stayed, you know, as long as they did, but I, I, I kept taking auditions. The, the idea was to get a job. So I took an audition in, in the, at, down at the Musicians Union in Philadelphia, the conductor of the Indianapolis Symphony, Fabian Savitsky, who was, a, I guess he was related to Serge Kusevitsky. Now, legend had it that uh, Kusevitsky paid uh, uh, Savitsky to shorten his name to Savitsky. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it may be a true story. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, I took the audition, and, and I won it. Uh, Principal clarinet in the Indianapolis Symphony. Uh, and uh, I, so I didn't know exactly what to do at that point. And I went to the director of the Curtis, with, who, who was Ephraim Zimbalist at the time, who was a fa very famous violinist. And he said, you take the job. He said, you can always come back. Well, I took the job, and I became the most famous dropout of the Curtis Institute <laughs> <laughs> at that point. Uh, so I went to the Indianapolis Symphony uh, at the age of 16, uh, which, you see, in those days, people took auditions because, one, you might go to an orchestra that paid you $5 a week more or the season was two weeks longer, or they played interesting repertoire, or they made recordings. So you were always taking auditions. Today, uh, you could uh, make a career in almost any of those places because they, they are year-round. Even the New York Philharmonic in those days was only 28 weeks. That was their season. So anyway, I, I went to the Indianapolis Symphony, and, uh, and I kept taking auditions along the way, and uh, I, I went to the uh, Bush Chamber Players, uh, the following season. It was a conductorless orchestra. Bush uh, was a famous violinist who had a string quartet, and, uh, and, uh, and he'd start the music off from the concertmaster chair, 
and uh, Rudolf Serkin was his son-in-law, and he and Serkin would play a concerto one night, and Bush would play one the other night. So you got to learn how to play without watching a conductor's beat, which was terrific. Plus, it paid much more than the Indianapolis Symphony. <laughs> and Bush, who became a father figure to me and probably a lot of others, uh, he said, "You have to play for this person. You have to play for that person." And uh, I, he had me audition for uh, William Steinberg, who was a really great conductor, who was a protege of Toscanini, and uh, who was the music director of the Buffalo Philharmonic at the time. Well, I played for him, and I got that job. I won the job. Kept winning auditions. <laughs> Very lucky. Yeah, and it was all luck, Mr. Dreyer. <laughs> luck was a, a strong part of it, I'm sure. But, but uh, so while I was at the Buffalo Philharmonic, which was a very good orchestra, it had a brand new concert hall, it was, uh, it was qu quite fun to, to play there, you know, except they had a lot of snow. I remember that it was... Uh, Still the, do. The winters there were very, very uh, noticeable. <laughs> a anyway, uh, I got this, this uh, notification if I wanted to go to, to New York, this was during the season in Buffalo, uh, and play uh, an audition for uh, Dr. Bruno Walter was this legendary conductor, you know, he was Gustav Mahler's uh, assistant and so forth. And uh, I went down on a weekend that we, when we didn't have a concert in Buffalo, and I, and I played for Walter and a committee of principal players of the Philharmonic. And this was at, Car this was at in Carnegie in, Hall. This is what is now Weill Recital Hall. Uh, the little hall? The little no, little no. Hall. Uh, no, I played in the green room uh, of Carnegie Hall. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, in, uh, I guess uh, uh, Dr. Walter had an office near, okay. nearby and so forth. And uh, I recognized some of the players, you know, they were famous, like John Corigliano, the concertmaster, and uh, Leonard Rose, the cellist, uh, John Woomer, the flutist, Harold Gomberg, the oboe, you know, they, they were well-known players. And I played for them, and, and you know, lengthy uh, audition. In those days, you had to do a lot of sight reading. They, they didn't give you the list a month in advance, you know. You, they said, play something, and you played something you'd prepared, and then they, sa they started putting music up, and, and you would play it, you know, so, or not play it, as the case may be. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a, but you had a pianist at that uh, audition. He played the piano. Bruno Walter played the piano okay. for me on two of the excerpts. And uh, I think he was trying to foul me up on one of them because, <laughs> because the key didn't sound right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, so... I heard, I was overheard somebody say that he said that I would be a valuable member of the orchestra, but I, a week later I got uh, a letter uh, offering me the post, and it took about five seconds to sign it, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's how it started. It was, uh, it was amazing. And that was 1940? 48. 48. And you were 19, 19 right. and coming back home after spending a little time in Indianapolis, a little time in Buffalo. Right. And you got to come home and, right. and cross well, the Well, you know, when I got that job, the next day uh, I had a headline on the Brooklyn Eagle. You bet. You bet. That's great. It said, Burrow clarinetist wins something <laughs> or other. It's just quite a picture, isn't it? Um, this young man, not yet 20 years old, in a room with Bruno Walter at the piano, and Harold Gomberg, and Leonard Rose, and John Corigliano, and some other players, the committee of principals of the New York Philharmonic. Well, my, my father thought I was Joe Lewis, champion of the world. 